want to thank you both, Dale Walconin and Paul Blanche. Um, and uh, Paul, you're the nuclear expert, and Dale, you're the uh, my associate producer on Facing Future. Today, we're discussing again the San Onofre uh, uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, let me call it a debacle, or a debacle in the making. Yeah, what we're seeing here is a, an aerial shot, whether it's taken from a Google or drone or whatever we have. And basically, we're, the, you can see the Pacific Ocean in the bottom. And then you see the two nuclear power plants on the, on the right, San Onofre Unit 2 and Unit 3. Uh, San Onofre Unit 1 is used to be which was decommissioned in 1976, used to be where the red circle is. Uh, so now what they've done, they've taken away unit one and they've stored the fuel uh, for unit one in a horizontal configuration that is uh, within the circle. You can see the two lines. These are spent fuel from unit one. And then just below that toward the ocean, are is fuel from all the fuel, 3,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel removed as part of the decommissioning effort of San Onofre units two and three. So all the fuel, 45 years of it, is stored within that uh, area where the arrow is pointing. So um, there's no longer any spent fuel pool at San Onofre, it's all in canisters? It's all in canister. It's all been removed from the pools and put into canisters. But the problem is with any new type of system to store, you know, very deadly 45 years worth of, of spent nuclear fuel, um, they buried it in the ground. The problem here is a flood. And if there's a flood, which can be caused by a tsunami or a storm surge or a storm or a cyclone comes up this way, which are rare, uh, the analysis shows, if you look at the red arrow, uh, that that area uh, becomes flooded with nine feet of water uh, will cover all the canisters. It is potentially catastrophic should those be flooded with water, even if it's only flooded for 10 minutes. Uh, it can be catastrophic. And all I get from the NRC and we've petitioned them, filed Freedom of Information Act requests, and all we get are very, very evasive answers. Now, if you want to go to the next. Okay, this is a cross-section profile. And what we see here is to the left is the Pacific Ocean, and the water level is the mean high water level at, oh, it looks like seven, eight feet. And that uh, mean high water level is just below the canister. Now, when we say mean high water level, that's the average high water level. Uh, the absolute high water level, uh, at king tides uh, in the fall, uh, probably goes up much, much higher than that. Does it go up 10 feet? 20 feet, would you, what would you get? I, I would guess maybe another 10 feet for maximum high level. I don't uh, have a lot of certainty with that 15, answer. A 15 foot seawall, uh, and that is not sufficient for a well, high tide or a king tide? Yeah, they, they put that up. And again, it's for uh, public illusion. Oh, we have a seawall to protect the fuel, that seawall wouldn't hold back 10 feet of water. I mean, if we look at seawalls to protect it against flooding, be it 
around New Orleans, Fukushima, any dangerous thing you want to protect against. Uh, the the seawalls to protect against hold back the ocean is typically 20 to 30 feet across at its base. And that's what we'll say. This seawall does nothing. So, so you're saying it structurally would collapse if, if a re reasonable amount of water was pressed up against it? It would totally collapse. It's not designed for anything more than aesthetics and maybe keeping terrorists away so they can't climb in. Amateur, amateur terrorists. Amateur terrorists. This is a picture of a seawall, which is probably 12 to 16 inches thick, and it, it appears as though it looks like those are steel pilings that are driven in for coffer dams and then sprayed with some uh, type of concrete mixture. Yeah. But uh, again, it's great for aesthetics, but uh, we'll do absolutely nothing to... No, what, you, uh, what you said before, Paul, was that for it to be substantive enough to hold back the water, it would have to be 20 feet, 16 to 20 feet wide, thick at the bottom. And right. you're talking about something that's about 16 inches thick at the bottom. Right. And even if, even if it were a properly designed seawall, the actual flood is projected to be above that height. So it's I don't know what it is, whether it's uh, just to provide comfort to the public or satisfy some regulator or the fig leaf. What it is. It's a fig leaf. How would they take them out of there? And is there a place to put them? That is the $64 million question there, Dale. Yes. <laughs> well, or more than that. Know, yeah. There, <laughs> That is a sixty-four dollar question. But our generation who remembers the sixty-four thousand dollar question back when that was a lot of money. Yeah, um, there's no solution. I can tell you about all the problems. Okay, let's get it out of here and let's put it somewhere else. Well, the first question is how do you get it out? Second question is how do you transport it? Uh, Safely. These things are 25 feet high and they rely on their vertical orientation to provide cooling. Once you lay them down on a rail car to transport them, uh, you can't do it because there's no way to cool them. Um, there's nowhere to put it. We're looking at the industry is looking at sites in Texas and New Mexico, but uh, I don't believe it's ever going to be approved. Plus that we have the transportation issue. A lot of people say, okay, why don't we, it's, it's on military property, uh, Navy or Marine property called Camp Pendleton, you know, many, many square miles. Why don't we just uh, move it onto Camp Pendleton at higher ground? Um, my understanding is that the Navy has, uh, said no thank you to they don't want it either i don't want nobody wants this stuff They're smarter than the average public well being next well, there navy must be some some way to to uh, to deal with this otherwise we're in very big trouble uh we have to be able to find some somebody has to find a solution to pulling those canisters out of there and dealing with it i'm looking uh, at this where, how do you begin what is the beginning of that you, you've skipped you've skipped over perhaps the biggest problem of all, which is who's gonna pay for it and how much is it gonna cost? And I'll have to say that the industry and the regulatory agencies are all driven by, oh, we don't wanna pay for it. So it's gonna get dumped on the public at some point. Of course it is. You know, the industry has paid into the federal government, I think it's a tenth of a percent, a tenth of a cent Per kilowatt hour. So the government fund has accumulated somewhere around $30 billion to uh, take care of this uh, fuel uh, by the, uh, I forget what the act is, but uh, every taxpayer, every ratepayer paid into this fuel fund to $30 billion. And 
Department of Energy was supposed to take it in 1998. They had no place to take it. They had nowhere to take it to or get it to wherever. So they defaulted. Utilities are suing them for their, they want their money back. And it, it's an absolute mess. The federal government has no answer. As I said before, the biggest problem, environmental problem this world is facing is climate change. The second biggest problem is what do we do with this stuff? And it's not just the United States. It goes to, you know, China, Finland, Russia. Could this fuel be taken out of its canisters and could it be used in that way? No, if, we, if you know, we, we tried it at Mars, Illinois, and another facility to recycle some fuel that was a monumental failure. You look at every government-run facility from Savannah River to Hanford to Rocky Flats to every government facility to Idaho has just absolutely turned into an environmental disaster. Uh, if we could get it and someone would buy it and, and put it into a deep geological disposal, I'd be happy with that. But reprocessing you know, from what I've seen from the performance with the, uh, you know, federal government, Department of Energy, it's... You know, but they no do it in, in France and they do it in other countries. Uh, no, they really don't. The, uh, Finland probably is the most advanced and they've done some chemical separation of the fuel, but e even reprocessing does not reduce the amount of radiation. It just puts it in different locations. Radiation does not go away. The radioactive material still doesn't go down except from natural decay. And it still has to be disposed of. And we haven't got a place to dispose of. I talked to Bob Alvarez this afternoon, and he's a scientist who I'm known for 30 years. He's worked for John Glenn in the Senate. And um, I specifically asked him a question. And again, this is the, probably the world's uh, highest, highest qualified expert on spent nuclear fuel. I said, Bob, if these canisters become flooded with water and water enters around the fuel, the documentation I have says it will go critical, which means that it will be a self-sustaining nuclear reaction inside the silo that gets flooded. Now, and I asked Bob, do you know what the consequences of that would be? He said, no, I don't. I've never studied that because no one has ever postulated that. Uh, I can tell you from my training and historically looking at inadvertent criticalities throughout the world that it could be catastrophic. Um, when you get a, a criticality, you have an uncontrolled fission reaction that generates many, many megawatts of instantaneous heat, um, which could explode. And I'm not saying it's going to be an atomic bomb with a mushroom, but having a few or many megawatts generated in a small area is going to have severe consequences. We just don't know what those consequences would be. And of course the NRC will never do an analysis, although we will try to force them into it. But I've been working with the inspector general's office and the people seem to um, respect him. Uh, this is a picture taken from ground level and what you see are those little domes that are probably five foot in diameter that uh, these are air cool so air comes in the side where the square uh, areas are it goes in down alongside of the canister that contains the spent fuel then comes up and is exhausted out of the uh, round screens that we see above now we talk about a flood and they say a flood will cover nine feet above the pad 
the pad is that concrete you see below those square structures. So uh, the inlet and outlet would be totally immersed in water and it would fill uh, the area around the canister and we'll see what that means on the next three slides. Okay. So this is just a, a oversimplified view. These holes are 25 feet deep, the red area uh, shows the canister, which is a stainless steel half inch thick that contains um, many tons, well, I, well, the 73 canisters and 3,000 tons. So it, it can, each, each canister contains more radioactive material than what was released at Chernobyl. So if you could go to the next slide, uh, Dale. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little more detailed drawing that shows where the air inlet passage comes in on the left side. And it comes in, it goes down, goes back up. And convective cooling uh, removes the heat. Now, the temperature on the outside of that red area, that temperature is about 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Yikes. If you, if you lose cooling uh, through a flood, which would block that cooling path, uh, temperature could go up to 792 degrees uh, we, and higher. Uh, we don't know how high it will go, but uh, the NRC just tells us, don't worry about it. We got it covered. Uh, well, the air inlets are at the top as I see, and there's, if water gets in there, there is no drain. That's, that's in this. no drain. Yeah, there, there is no drain. What, what happens here, uh, if you can go to the next slide, maybe I can describe it a little bit better. What would happen in the event of a, a flood? Of course, all those things where the arrows are, the cool air in and the hot air out, would be uh, filled with water. And if they're filled with water, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing because water is a better heat conductor than air and, and the water will circulate. The problem is the water will eventually boil out in about eight hours. And what will happen is all air and water flow and heat conduction will cease once it gets down about two feet from the bottom. Uh, you cannot recover. They have no equipment to recover and get that water out and reestablish cooling. They lie to us and say they do. Um, they, I know for a fact they don't have the hoses to go down and suck it out. They don't have the pumps. They don't have the power supply. They don't have anything. They, they say, oh, if it happens, we can pump it out. Well, you've got 73 of these things. And even at best, it's going to probably take three, four days to, you know, if everything worked well, to reestablish heat conduction out of one of these. But you got 73 of them and no equipment around. So that's one of the problems. And, you know, I talked about criticality. If you see the, you know, green thing that was in the past red, um, you know, I mentioned before that's at 450 degrees F. <laughs> what happens when that half inch steel uh, is exposed to 50 to 60 degree water from the Pacific Ocean? And again, their answer is nothing's going to happen. Uh, these won't crack. Uh, you know, you put a cast iron pan that's 500 degrees in cold water, it's probably going to crack on you. I'm, I'm, laughing uh, because, I'm laughing because you, you just inserted a very interesting little fact that at some point they changed their diagram from depicting the canister in red, which is the, so the color of danger, right. to depicting it in green, which is the color of save and safety, go ahead. So by changing the color of the casket, they may have saved us all. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, That's all we gotta do is make it cool. So um, yeah, so the danger is the, the real incredible danger to the people is if that green cask is breached and water gets in there, we have a disaster on our hand. Okay, these are Curie's um, 
a, a, a cure is a measure of the amount of radioactive material contained, you know, in a, in a volume. Uh, you know, what it started off with one gram of radi radium um, contained one curie. So, Madame Curie is, you know, that, that's how it was developed. Now, you can see here, you know, Chernobyl, how much was released, uh, you know, 10 million curies or something like that, the nuclear testing, the atmospheric testing. But just take a look at the songs, spent fuel pools, and how much radioactive material uh, is contained. Um, now, songs for the layperson is San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station? Correct. I'm sorry. Oh, no, we, that's okay. That's what I'm here for, to interpret. Yeah, we, we have our own nuclear language. And, uh, you, know, this, uh, you know, I looked at this you know, just now and saying, okay, if, if the spent fuel, say, number three, has 80 million curies, Oh, I see what this, this probably goes back. And this, this was maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. These were the curies contained in the various locations. Now, all that stuff from unit two and unit three spent fuel pools is added to the song's dry casts. So it would, well, the dry casts are now sitting at about 40 million, I think, with my eyesight. Yeah, it's still yeah, we'll go up to around greater. It's still greater than the Chernobyl accident, which is terrifying. Yeah, it, but in the dry cast now, we have something like 200 million curies of radioactive material. Right, if so, you put the purple and the, uh, the green and the blue all together, it would go way yeah. up. You know. So that's... That's what San Onofre has. Um, very aware of it, Josh, and okay. we're going to be terminating yeah. the call in about But two. San Onofre does not have any spent fuel pools anymore, you said. It's all in the cask. So it's just, we're just looking well, at the, the cask, right? The pools are there. They're probably still full of water, but they're going to be uh, demolishing the fuel uh, pools and taking the water away. And, uh, Unless it accidentally spills into the Pacific Ocean, in which case they'll just they'll just clear the beach for a few days. Yeah, well, I just see in the last week that Fukushima is going to discharge the radioactive water to the ocean and that's created world turmoil. I personally don't have a problem with that, but uh, radiation scares people. I, I have <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, it, it accumulates in the pelagic fish. And so I, you know, I mean, people are still eating sushi in, in huge numbers and nobody's studying what latency there is in the accumulation. So I'm, I've got a problem with it, but. Well, uh, again, the majority of what's going to be discharged from Fukushima was discharged from Three Mile Island is tritium. And Tritium is not that harmful. Uh, has a biological uh, residence of, you know, it's water. You pee it out. Uh, it just doesn't stay, and it's not that harmful unless it's in, you know, real, real high levels, uh, high concentration. So the concentration that they're proposing to release from Japan is is so minimal, so below regulatory standards, either here or Japanese. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. You got to do something with it. It's nice and to get some good news on this issue at yeah, all. I, I don't have a problem. I, okay. Uh, okay. Not with tritium. If it were cesium or strontium, yes, I'd have a problem. Yeah. Okay. But I don't with tritium. Okay. Well, Paul, we wish you the very best in your negotiations with this new NRC uh, Inspector General, and um, we hope that uh, you can help to resolve the situation. And thank you so much for your, all your work and effort. Yeah, well, thank you. But I really need congressional help from anyone, and I can 
you know, I'm going to prime the Congress people before we meet with the Inspector General as to the uh, significance of what we're dealing with here.